The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in a tomb. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons bade Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons and God prayed that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. In the summer of 1970, I followed my college girlfriend to where she lived in Silver Spring, Maryland outside Washington, D.C. Perhaps you remember your late adolescent love that led you to do stupid things like move to another city for the summer, live with a bunch of friends in a rental house, and work whatever job you could find just to tend to the flutters of your heart. My girlfriend's father managed a Sears delivery warehouse, so that was my summer job delivering washers, dryers, refrigerators, and stoves in the District of Columbia. When I walked into the warehouse that first day with my girlfriend's father, a gregarious Irishman, I was face to face with the reality that I was the only white guy among about 50 black men. They were standing around the border of the warehouse looking less than excited about my arrival. In fact, they looked downright hostile. It wasn't that I was just a young white dude with long hair and mustache. I was their boss's daughter's boyfriend. The word was already out. I walked in silence alongside two large black men to a loaded delivery, delivery truck and squeezed between them in the truck cab. You could cut the tension with a knife, which I figured might end up in my back. So you're dating the boss's daughter. Yep. Listen, we're not supposed to take tips, but we do. You all right with that? As long as you cut me in, they relaxed a bit. Sometimes we stop at the end of a long day and have a cold one before we head in. You good with that? Yep. They relaxed a bit more. They watched me for a week or so, and when they split the tips with me that first day, I was as liable to be fired as they were. 
Then we had our first beer and the word got around that I was cool. It was hard work carrying heavy appliances up and down narrow staircases that was not easy or simple work. We had to have one another's backs, literally. So I also earned their trust with my sweat. Mr. Muldoon never do a thing for me about tips or about a beer at the end of a hot, humid DC day. But at the end of the day, we were left with our differences and similarities. I was still a white college student from a suburb of Columbus, Ohio, working a summer job. These men were of a different race from the District of Columbia, likely working their permanent job, different backgrounds, different cultures. We shared hard work, the feeling of sweat rolling down our backs and brows, a similar joy over getting a nice tip, a familiar annoyance at some nasty customer, a shared interest in sports, soul music, and the taste of a cold beer. These realities were held in tension, the differences and similarities. Within a faith community like ours, the differences and similarities between us as individuals are meant to be transcended by our identity as children of God, united in a vision of ministry and purpose as our expression of the body of Christ. Transcend means to go beyond the limits. Transcend means to overcome the negative or restrictive aspects of our humanity. This is the Christian vision. Paul first speaks of this vision by referring to the law. He sees the law as a framework that both guards in a positive way and imprisons in a negative way. Guards by providing boundaries for people in community. Don't steal. Don't be envious of what your neighbor has. Don't do violence to one another. Observe a day of rest. Honor your parents. Yet in prisons, because the boundaries inevitably become ways to judge and divide us from one another. This is what all religious rules and laws eventually do. Provide a means by which we contrast and compare ourselves. We judge, and judgment causes separation. According to Paul, the law of God functions as a school bus driver, getting us to the school of Jesus Christ so that we can leave the law behind and begin functioning at a higher level without all the categories and divisions. So the law is the elementary school and following Jesus Christ is the graduate school. In his day, Paul gives us the categories and labels that divided people, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, man and woman. In our day, divisions persist in congregations and in the broader church, running along lines of ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, political affiliation, and more. In my first congregation full of long-standing families and clans, one of the oldest congregations in Virginia, people began retiring down from the Washington, D.C. area. These were professional people, unlike the farmers and factory workers in the congregation. And the congregation struggled with divisions along education, social standing, and life experience. How does a retired CIA agent who worked countless countries overseas and a third generation farmer who hadn't ever traveled outside the state find common ground? In Paul's vision, all human divisions are to be ultimately irrelevant to our primary identity 
as members of the body of Christ. You know as well as I that the larger culture today has very little common ground. The divisions are deadly. The chasm between the alt-right and the progressive left appears enormous. Even families have been torn apart by political differences. The church, the local congregation, CLC, is meant to be a beacon for the culture on how to recognize the differences and similarities, grow beyond them, recognizing not only our common humanity, but our common kinship in Christ. Any attempt to categorize and label one another in a congregation diminishes us on the basis of those categories and labels. It's a sign of spiritual immaturity, a sign that we're still in elementary school. I have yet to lead a congregation where the members have transcended the divisions by more highly valuing their identity as children of God than their categories and labels. I'm certainly willing to admit that I likely didn't have the spiritual maturity myself in order to lead a congregation, but I invite us to make this effort just to see what the experience might be like. I imagine it would be quite enlivening and in healing for us all. Since about the eighth grade, I've played in any number of bands with black and white musicians. Color ne never made one bit of difference. We transcended the limits. We transcended the negative aspects of race and culture. In a few minutes, we will play the sermon song. Let's see, we have a black drummer, Troy, who is not a member. Yours truly, an old white guy. Pat Bauer, a white woman. And Vincent Beatty, who none of us had met until 8.45 this morning. <laughs> All things being equal, Vincent's going to be joining us in the Saturday Night Contemporary Band. Jason can't be here this morning. He's a newer member, right? And you know Michael Walk, who's been playing with us, who's not a member either. But we don't care! While we're playing, I can guarantee you that Pat doesn't think, why is Vincent playing this morning? He's not even a member. Troy isn't thinking, who the heck is that honky playing the piano? I'm not thinking, I wonder if Jason's really been a member long enough to be playing in the band. Shouldn't you have to be here three years or something before you have a position like that? Or Michael better join the church if he wants to continue playing with us. Why not? because we transcend our differences and similarities for the sake of the song. We're lost in the music. We are attuned to one another so that we transcend the categories and divisions in order to play as one. One band, one song, united to communicate the music and lyrics to all of you. We model transcendence every Sunday. The differences fall away in our communication as we rehearse. I'll tell Pat to sing louder. Jason will ask me about a chord I miss putting in the chart. I'll tend the band, tell the band to play softer at one point. They'll tell me to mic the piano. Pat will tell Jason a string is out of tune. Troy will ask me, how the heck did I choose that song? We are straight with one another. The differences and similarities fall away for the sake of playing the song together. We're supportive and complimentary when Pat and Michael or I sing. Troy's a great drummer. You're gonna love Vincent's playing today. Troy's always in the pocket. Jason anchors things so solidly. And we don't go behind one another's back. 
We transcend for the sake of the song. This is how a congregation is meant to be. We transcend the differences and similarities for the sake of Jesus Christ and our mission together. We get lost in the spirit. Color, length of membership, income, education, class, gender, sexual orientation, everything transcended for the sake of Jesus Christ. And every time it is not, we fail at being who God wants us to be. It's that simple. I urge you to make the following small change in your thinking and in your speech. The change is this. CLC is first and foremost the congregation of Jesus Christ. Then it is our congregation, and then it is my congregation. You see the difference? Catch yourself if you ever speak of what they are doing or the decision they made. There is no they, there's just us. Being faithful to Paul's vision means there is no we there. We're in it together, united in a vision as the people of Christ, united in it being our congregation, a human community striving to transcend the differences and categories. Amen. Amen.
think the man upstairs must have took a vacation. It's a fire in my little girl's eyes Maybe it's a fire in my little girl's eyes